Okay, scene six is really short, and so we're going to do scene six and seven together. Um, and scene seven is not that long either. So Duncan and Banquo and all of Duncan's retinue, his entourage, all these hundreds of people, um, have arrived at Macbeth's castle. And they're talking about the castle and how safe it feels and how wholesome and sweet the air is. And there's a bit of dramatic irony here because it seems so safe and and wonderful when in fact it's probably the most dangerous place for Duncan to be because he doesn't know that inside um, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are planning his murder. We also have then Lady Macbeth coming out to greet King Duncan. And we see here where she is diabolical. She is able to look him in the face and tell him how much they love him and how devoted they are to him when, as she's looking him in the eyes, she's plotting his murder in her mind, which shows her, her depth of, of strength and, and maybe her evil. And so it's a very short scene, and it basically just gets the king to the palace, to the Macbeth's palace at Inverness and and shows a little bit of Lady Macbeth's character. We move on to scene seven and this is the dinner party. Um, Macbeth has left the party and he is um, contemplating whether they should do this or not. Now Lady Macbeth knows she can't leave him alone too long because his guilt conscience, his milk of human kindness will get the better of him. And so he comes up with about five or six reasons. He comes up with six reasons um, for why they should not do this deed. And at that point, Lady Macbeth comes in and brings up some reasons. He tells her they're not going to do it. And and she brings up reasons why they should and and sort of pushes him back in. Not that it's that hard because Macbeth really wants to do this. Um, she's just getting him through his quo uh, foibles, through his, his own um, guilty conscience. And then she tells him what the murder plot is that she's come up with. And he's amazed at, at how, um, how evil she can be and that she can come up with such a plan. So let's read scenes six and seven together. Castle hath a pleasant seat. The air nimbly and sweetly recommends itself unto our gentle senses. This guest of summer, the temple haunting martlet, does approve by his loved mansionry that the heaven's breath smells wooingly here. Mm. No jutty frees buttress nor coin of vantage, but this bird hath made his pendant bed and procreant cradle. Where they most breed and haunt, I have observed the air is delicate. See, see, our honored hostess. <laughs> the love that follows us sometime is our trouble, which still we thank as love. Mm. Herein I teach you how you shall bid God yield us for your pains and thank us for your trouble. <laughs> All our service, in every point twice done and then done double, were poor and single business to contend against those honors deep and broad wherewith your majesty loads our house. <laughs> for those of old and the late dignities heaped up to them, we rest your hermits. Uh, where's the <laughs> thane of Cawdor? We coursed him at the heels and had a purpose to be his purveyor. But he rides well, and his great love, sharp as his spur, hath helped him to his home before us. Fair and noble hostess, we are your guests tonight. Ah, oh, your servants ever have theirs, themselves, and what is theirs in compt to make their audit at your highness' pleasure, still to return your own. Give me your hand. Conduct me to mine host. We love him highly and shall continue our graces towards him. By your leave, hostess. If it were done when tis done, 
then to a well it were done quickly. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success, that but this blow might be the be-all and the end-all here. But here, upon this bank and shoal of time, we'd jump the life to come. But in these cases, we still have judgment here, that we but teach bloody instructions, which being taught, return to plague the inventor. This even-handed justice commends the ingredients of our poison chalice to our own lips. He's here in double trust. First, as I am his kinsman and his subject, strong both against the deed. Then, as his host, who should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek, hath been so clear in his great office that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off, and pity, like a naked newborn babe striding the blast, or heaven's cherubim horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air, shall blow the horrid deed in every eye, the tears shall drown the wind. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which o'erleaps itself and falls on the other. How oh, now, what news? He has almost supped. Why have you left the chamber? Hath he asked for me? No, you not, he has. We will proceed no further in this business. He hath honored me of late, and I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people, which would be worn now in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since? And wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely? From this time such I account thy love. Uh. Art thou afeard to be the same in thine own act and valor as thou art in desire? Wouldst thou have that which thou esteems the ornament of life, and live a coward in thine own esteem, letting I dare not wait upon I would, like the poor cat of the adage? Pretty peace. I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. What beast was then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. Nor time nor place did then adhere, and yet you would make both. They have made themselves, and that their fitness now does unmake you. I have given suck, and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out, had I so sworn as you have done to this. If we should fail... We fail? But screw your courage to the sticking place and will not fail. When Duncan is asleep, whereto the rather shall his day's hard journey soundly invite him, his two chamberlains will I with wine and wassail so convince that memory, the warder of the brain, shall be a fume, and the receipt of reason a limbeck only. When in swinish sleep their drenched natures lies as in a death, what cannot you and I perform upon the unguarded Duncan? What not put upon his spongy officers who shall bear the guilt of our great quell? Bring forth men, children only, for thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. Mm. Will it not be received when we have marked with blood those sleepy two of his own chamber and use their very daggers that they have done? T who dares receive it other, as we shall make our griefs and clamor roar upon his death? I am settled and bend up each corporal agent to this terrible feat. Away, and mock the time with fairest show. False face must hide what the false heart doth know. Okay, so we've read scene six and seven together, and um, six pretty much we don't need to discuss now. But we have a number of things we need to discuss um, in order for you to understand and answer your questions and know what's going on. Macbeth comes up, you're going to have to give five reasons, but Macbeth comes up with at least six reasons why they should not do this deed. 
first of all, he starts off with, if we were going to do it, I wish it would be over with already. Um, then he goes on to say, um, here upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. He's saying we could end up facing, um, we could end up facing judgment in the afterlife. We could end up going to hell for this. So that's one um, potential issue. Um, another one would be if they're caught, if people figure it out. In these cases, we still have judgment here. Um, and we could end up um, suffering judgment here. And it would be our own fault. He goes on to say that um, Duncan is, is in Macbeth's castle in double trust. First, Duncan is Macbeth's kinsman, his kin. They are family. They're actually cousins. Um, and then this is his king. Um, he is a subject to the king and supposed to serve the king. Both things are very serious. He also goes on to say he is the host of the king. And when you host somebody, when somebody is a guest in your house, it's your responsibility to protect them and keep them safe. Um, not, in fact, bear the knife yourself. And he goes on to explain that Duncan has been a good king, a kind king, that he has done nothing um, worthy of being murdered for, and that heaven itself might cry out in his taking off his murder. So, the only thing, Macbeth says, the only thing I have in my right, that I have a, the only reason I have a right to do this is my overvaulting ambition. That's all I've got is ambition, not any right to do this. Lady Macbeth at this point has realized that Macbeth is gone, and she goes and finds him. And he tells her, we're not going to do this deed. And this is where she pulls out the stops. This is where she manipulates him. Um, she's like... Oh, so what happened to what you wanted done? What happened to this ambition? Um, I see. I see how much you love me. Um, she says, um, from this time, such I account thy love. Um, oh, you don't love me enough, is what she's kind of saying there. And then on top of it, um, are you afeard? Are you afraid to do what you want? Um, she even implies that he's a coward. So um, that's several of the reasons there. Now, let's see. Macbeth responds to her while she's harassing him, as it were, with, I dare do all that become a man. Um, I'm a man. I do what, what becomes a man, what is appropriate for a man to do. And then she turns this on him and says, oh, when you promised to do this, then you were a man. Um, sort of almost questioning his masculinity, and, and um, which, of course, is always effective for men. Then she moves on and says, to be so much more than you were, you would be so much more the man. She's playing off his masculinity, but there's also a touch of seduction here. Um, I've seen this acted on the stage, and Lady Macbeth is always a little flirtatious. Oftentimes she's rubbing his chest, you know, or, or has her hand on him in some way, and there's a little bit of a sense of seduction here that she's using. Then... She goes on, and this is where she really pulls out the stops. Um, she goes on and says that she has, she has fed a child. In other words, she has breastfed a child. This is a time before bottles and formula and things like that. And so um, the only way to keep an infant alive is through breastfeeding. And that's what she's saying here. Um, 
I have given suck, and now how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while I was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from its bump gum, boneless gums and dashed its brains out if I'd sworn to you. If, I, if you wanted me to, if I'd promised you this, I would kill my own child for you, and you won't do this thing for this little thing for us? Um, really kind of wicked. I don't think it's true. I think one of her motivations is any children they have together um, stand to have a better life and better prospects. Sons stand to become king next if they have sons. Daughters can be married off to higher nobility. So I think that she's manipulating. She's just being manipulative here. Macbeth says if we should fail, then she's like, okay, we fail, but we should try. Then she gives him the plan, and the plan is she's going to go and party with Duncan's um, soldiers, and that she's going to get them drunk till they pass out. Then she'll take their daggers, and Macbeth can um, stab them with stab Duncan with the daggers of his own guard, and um, then. They can plant the daggers back on the servants, and everybody will assume that it's the servants. Sorry, they started vacuuming it. It distracted me. Um, and Macbeth is surprised by this. Um, but he also seems to have some respect for her that she can come up with such a plan. This is an important scene. Um, it shows their dynamic, and it shows kind of what's going to follow. All right. We'll move on to Act 2. At this point, you're going to be taking the quiz over Act 1. Uh, so be sure to look back over your uh, whole act.